the University of the Vedratis Rand. I used to teach at this university, and it's incredibly wonderful to be back, specifically to see the relief on the faces of my erstwhile colleagues that I'm now somebody else's problem. But it's, it's, this university is a wonderful place, and one can only compliment them on the quality of what we see here. My own involvement in the Carl and Emily Fuss Foundation competition is absolutely purely by accident. And it's one of the most wonderful accidents that's ever happened in my life. And I cannot say them thank you enough for this wonderful opportunity. And when I speak about the wonder of this competition, I think it's the people that I'm dealing with. It's absolutely incredible to deal with this quality of student and their professionalism, their commitment to architecture, and their commitment to the advancement of our profession. If we go back to Carl and Emily Fuchs, we're going back to a previous generation, and all the people in this audience, I only see one or two, would remember Fuchs where the stoves, fridges, televisions, and all of that. Carl and Emily Fuchs started this very young in their lives. Mr. Fuchs was about 16, I think, we went for apprenticeship to become a plumber, which is very much related to our profession. And from that, he built up an industrial conglomerate in South Africa that was unprecedented. They didn't have any children, and all their hundreds of millions were left into the Fuchs Foundation. Six years ago, they started to support architectural training with this competition. If we look at the context for this competition, one needs to understand where does it fit in. It's one of the most silent of competitions in South Africa. And the one interesting fact that when students are chosen, they all get a little bit surprised that they specifically were chosen. But they're a very select group of people because it's only one from each university and it has to be the best over three years. But when we go back to the context, we see that Marion Roberts Des Baker is 30 and 15,000. Corobrick is 50,000 plus the regional awards. And the Fuchs is three times 50,000. So just in terms of money, it is the biggest competition in the country. What, if, what does this competition promote? Sustained academic <coughs> excellence over long periods of time. What is the hallmark of a good architect? It is that kind of architect who can survive in any condition. It's not the design guru or superstar. It's not the superstar in terms of construction. It's the superstar in terms of everything. And it's that kind of thing that we promote. It also promotes self-reflection. Because in the preparation of the work for the competition, it helps the student to self-reflect on their own work, but it also helps the university to self-reflect on what they do. And I hope the universities are using that. We at WITS, at least, take our students' portfolios incredibly seriously, and we're trying to make our offerings to students better via this competition. As we've said, it's the eight schools of architecture that has the final degree, and it's the highest academic <laughs> average, and then they present a portfolio, and that portfolio is then scrutinized. This is the way that everything is judged, 
and it's judged by five people, people that the students have never met. And when you visit, when you attend those presentations, it's incredibly enlightening to see how good the top students are and how professional they are and the way that they actually engage with the panel that look at their work. Here's the previous winners. And I will run through them fast because some of them is now in other parts and I see some of them here and obviously the three winners of this year is also here. If we do a collective overview of these winners, that is what we find. Now I think this is important to understand how are we performing? The University of Cape Town has got five winners so far out of the six years. The University of the Witwatersrand Strand has got four. Tswane University of Technology has got three. University of the Free State, where we are, has got two. University of Johannesburg has got two. KwaZulu Natal has got one. And the University of Pretoria has got one. What does this say? And one might not or should not speculate in public what this is all saying, but it might say that there is this invisible thing in the back. We, we've got students who are working incredibly hard to simply stay afloat. If we look at it in a different sense, over the six years, the Fuchs Foundation has put 900,000 into the student's education. This must be one of the highest amounts that has been put into student education over the recent times. And I think it's in this sense where we are actually needing to take a certain responsible view to all of this. And then I'd like to as the following three students, which I'm sure are here, to come and make their presentations to you. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike Stratham, and I represent Schwann University of Technology. Uh, it's a great privilege, first of all, to be here to speak about my experience with the first competition. I'd like to thank Paul Kutzer, the coordinator at the Fuchs Foundation, for this opportunity. Okay. I would also like to encourage uh, all of you guys who are seeing this presentation to consider the fact that you may be the future participants in this competition and like to inspire you, hopefully, to work towards it. Just a bit about myself. As you can see, the, the main word in the presentation is curiosity. And I consider myself to be a very curious person as from as far as I could remember seeing bridges and large deal structures reminded me of giant jungles, which I always had this idea of exploring or climbing on. And then further, seeing dilapidated buildings kind of gave us a mystery of a story that needed to be told and explored. And that's something that's driven me prominently throughout my architectural profession so far, my academic career. So now that you know a little bit about me, I'm going to let this presentation I present to the judges right in the background as I explain to you how that contributed to the competition. First of all, as Paul Kutzer mentioned, this counts as 50% of the competition's work. So you are actually participating in this competition from the moment you start first year as a potential participant. The portfolio also needs to showcase a variety of your talents such as design, theory of design, contract documentation, construction methods, and various aspects that have gone into your full academic career. This, the, another benefit of this portfolio is that it also gives you the opportunity to reflect on who you are and where you've come from so far in your academic career to understand what it is that makes up who you are in architecture. And another advantage as well is that, as Paul mentioned, 
you get to identify the flavor of your varsity as well as seeing the flavor of the other varsities that are out there. So I had the opportunity of learning from my fellow contestants as well as them getting the opportunity to learn from me. Another aspect of the competition is that you get to explain things that have had an influence in your life, such as travel, where I got to live in Dubai and see their architecture. And then I got to go to Cyprus where I witnessed a lot of their ruins and then remember for its extreme beauty. And these are all things that through my life actually had an influence <coughs> on my architecture today. Then one of my other hobbies is photography, which allows me to study objects and things from another point of view, which allows me the opportunity to understand things from perspectives that you probably wouldn't have seen or experienced before through your natural eyes. Then coming to the actual 24-hour in Loge, where we actually arrived at University of Pretoria hosted the competition this year, which I'd like to thank them for that as well. Um, it started off with the site visits. We didn't actually know what we were going to design yet. They hadn't given us the brief. It was only once we actually got to the site and started walking around that Paul Kutzer handed us the brief where we then got to stand around and we actually read it right there on site for the first time to understand this elaborate story about a grandfather and his grandchildren. Once we read the story and kind of came to grips with what it was we were going to have to design, we started doing an analysis of the context because as a collective, we needed to propose a starting point for all of us. This is just some of the common stuff you see on the side right there, dried mopani worms that you can buy and eat as you please. We didn't try that, we tried to convince some people too. <laughs> they weren't ignorant enough. <laughs> then we were just standing around pointlessly at some places looking a bit lost some more of the trade that was happening on the streets and this is the culture that we picked up in the context it was extremely informal trading orientated there was a lot of rubbish in some places but just somehow it didn't really affect on that, have an effect on the atmosphere lots of trees and then the wonderful freezing cold studio that we got to work in I think a couple of us almost got frostbite in there luckily we had some computers as heaters this is where we actually spent the next, it was probably 20 hours of the competition after the site visit, preparing our 24 hour proposal. And those are obviously the other contestants. Now the site was located on the northern western sector of Pretoria Western, the boundary of the, site, the CBD. That top left dot is the site that we had. It's located near Gateway, so prominent access and near the zoo near the zoo as well, excuse me. This is what the context looked like, as you've seen a bit before. That center orange line represents the actual site, which had an existing old house on it. And then, just for my personal entry into the competition in the 24-hour in Loge, is the brief was this extremely dramatic storyline. Um, I don't have time to go into the full history of it, but it boiled down to a grandfather who set up this empire and left it to his grandchildren who now wanted to honor him. And on top of that drama, I had nothing by 9 o'clock the next morning in a 24-hour competition. So I was kind of stressed out and I had to develop a concept at the speed of lightning. And that's when I decided to go back and look at the brief. I started analyzing it and I looked at the story and I found the potential to add more drama to it, which was already driving Paul to tears. <laughs> so, it was a final starting point for the competition for me. And what you see there on the right hand side is a long, what I've called a tribute walk. And that was to this tree that this grandfather planted on the site originally. Where this tree was a symbol of him indicating I will, I will land on the site and I will establish myself to grow into the context. And that was set up by the grandfather. Now the grandchildren came back, one being an introvert, the other extrovert, and they wanted to create a house each to live in, but it needed to be separate because of their different lifestyles. So they said that we want to live in celebration of our grandfather, and we buried him under this tree, and we would like to celebrate that aspect. And the reason behind the burying under the tree was because of the fact that the grandfather lived illegally in his previous context where he established himself. 
and that was a symbolic reaction to illegally burying him in their yard. <coughs> this is a section of what the final proposal looked like, with some, I'm not going to explain too much detail what the spaces were, but it boiled down to the two houses upstairs, and then downstairs was kind of a space that gave back to the community, which is something the grandfather wanted to do. This is a perspective from behind the tree, looking back towards the entrance of the house, showing how the two houses were orientated around this tree and this tribute to their grandfather. And another perspective of that with the reflection pool to symbolically represent reflecting on his life. Then, sorry guys, the font seems to be missing here. But the first experience isn't all work and no play. Uh, Justin, the UP representative from University of Pretoria, actually arranged this wonderful tour for us of Pretoria where we went to Union Buildings to witness the sunrise and we got to explore through the gardens there and indulge a bit in the history of the Union Buildings and Pretoria. This is what we got to experience. We were sitting around, messing around, having fun. And then as a final kind of closing event to this whole competition, we got to reflect with each other on this experience at Cafe Riche on Church Square. We got to just talk about the different experiences, the diversity of our points of views, and everybody seemed to want to drink this coffee, which apparently was amazing. I did not try it. And then all of us as a group just chilling out there, unwinding. And that is the end of it. So I'd just like to thank you guys for this opportunity to present my Fox experience to all of you. And I really do encourage all the students that would like to participate in this work hard. It's worth it. It has an impact on your life. So thank you very much. us to be. Um, so just, yeah, just going on from what Mike was talking about, um, he explained the project brief really nicely, which I'm thankful for. Um, but what I'm going to do is just going to jump right into sort of my portfolio and like design manifesto and then go on to the 24-hour project, um, just so you can kind of see and get an idea of what we actually had to submit for, for this project. Okay, so... Um, the first part of my portfolio that I submitted, I kind of did this like crazy analysis of our experience efforts in undergrad. I don't really understand it myself, so it's, it's okay if you don't. Um, but basically it was just something that we, we looked at um, in terms of like how, I, how much I enjoyed um, certain projects and you know what, what I got from certain projects. And really BITS does Give, give an opportunity for a lot of different aspects of architecture. You know, I mean, all, I'm sure all universities do. And this was just showing my growth period um, across the three years. I'm really just peaking in the third year. Um, okay, so just talking a bit about studying at WITS. Um, obviously, we, we quite, we're situated quite close to the Johannesburg CBD, um, which is quite a crazy space. I mean, it's in constant flux and change. Um, because, you know, in the 90s it did empty at one point and now there's a lot of immigrants and different kinds of people that have now moved back into the city, different kinds of people from other countries. Um, and there's quite a, an interesting um, energy that exists in, in the CBD that we, we have the great opportunity of actually drawing from, which is really, really nice. Um, there's also quite a strong um, emphasis on social awareness um, because of this very social fluctuating situation. Um, and there's obviously quite a, a nice opportunity for exchange for information um, with, with these very, very different people. Um, so I think all of these, these opportunities that we're able to parallel with really allows for like excellent opportunity for creativity because there's, there are so many problems that need to be solved um, on all levels. So I mean, it's, it's a great, great place to learn, I think, because in every aspect, you need to grow and grow with your city and develop the space that you live in. Okay, so just running through some of my projects. This was my first year project. Um, and we, it was on a, a site in Cottesloe, which is very close to UJ, um, which is Rachel probably 
speak about, well, it's very close to her anyway. So um, we, our brief was to build a house for an artist. Um, and it's, it's opposite the metal works, the gas works, if anyone knows, in, in Johannesburg. So um, in typical first year style, it became quite a superficial project a little bit, um, where I reflected, hopefully some of, some of the first years in this audience do better than I did. Um, but it became quite a literal project in terms of like relating to the site, um, you know, just echoing the steel structure and like submerging it sort of like a mine. Um, so there's this very industrial feel. Um, I think the spaces are really bad, so hopefully from then <laughs> I've grown a bit. Um, so those are just some of the drawings that we did everything by hand in first year. Um, and the very disgusting tunnel that you have to enter to get into the building. Um, okay, and then just moving on to second year, um, we, we did this very interesting project in, a, in an area close to the Johannesburg CBD called Yeovil, um, which is quite an interesting space. Um, there's a lot of, as I said, different immigrants that are now living in this area, and there's something happening which, yeah, which they refer to as subletting, where um, someone sort of just takes over an apartment, which is quite big, and then sublets it to many other people. And people actually land up living in um, almost like a, a room within a room. So rooms defined by curtains and furniture. So what we had to do was just basically interview a couple of people from this area and then develop a space relating to their problems and issues. So um, yeah, this was just a diagram showing the person that I interviewed and the different spaces that they've lived in. And they're all these very, very tiny spaces that they move through and um, often there's just, um, they just take their furniture with them or a suitcase. There's not very much ownership um, you know, and connection to, to space itself. So what we, yeah, this was just a, a, re a rental scheme showing the subletting process. It's quite complicated. Um, yeah, and what you get for certain amounts of money. Um, okay, so then just our how we related to the brief was to create something that allowed for um, obviously eco economic uplift, upliftment so people could live and connect better to the communities that they live in and create something more, a lot more sustainable. So um, what I proposed was something that was, that was called Live, Work, Sell, uh, which became this urban trellis, which was basically a framework for people to latch onto and to grow and adapt as, as the community seems to need, um, as well as growing with time and, you know, um, and, and improving one's economic standing. Okay, um, so this was just part of our scheme. It's quite simplistic. Um, but the first, the first thing that we proposed was to create um, sort of like an urban farm um, at the, the back of the site, which we, on the north side of the site. Um, where um, occupants could grow food um, to self-sustain themselves and then to sell it on the other side, which is the street-facing street side, and obviously make money from that and support the surrounding community, which has a huge population. Um, the other part of the, the design concept was um, to propose a, a neutral room, which is shown on the plans um, on the left-hand side over there, which could then be um, acted as sort of this neutral space that could be absorbed into the, into the um, living space as another bedroom or become like a, a seed storing room or um, a shop. So it became this very adaptive, um, breathable project. Um, we entered this into the ship competition, but we didn't win, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, that was, we just then took the same concept and moved into construction drawings, um, which are over there. Um, then another second year project we did was called, um, it was a street life project, and we just, it was really just dealing with the issue of Johannesburg's very inert um, suburban experience where, you know, people live behind very high walls and pretty much no one sees anybody, especially in the, north, the northern suburbs, which is really unfortunate. So what we decided to do, um, I, I did this with another girl, Bronwyn Alcock, um, was to remove um, remove the car actually from from the city and just deal with that issue and, and see what opportunities opportunities it would open up. So we, we proposed a system where um, just to support um, the, the other transport systems like the BRT and Caltrain, which already exist, 
we proposed a suburban slipstream system, which is basically a network of bicycles, which would then connect to your, your bus systems. Um, but then the next question was, um, these are just um, proposals of what it might look like, these little stations. Um, the question was, what do we then do with our garages? So this became also quite an interesting adaptive project where um, occupants of, of houses could, you know, turn their, their garages into um, restaurants or um, anything sort of community related and then in that way create more sustainable communities which relate better to the streets and to street life. Um, and that was just a threshold diagram of how it would relate to more softer pedestrian orientated streets. Um, okay, then this is third year, um, our Des Baker project. That year we had to design a sustainable school in a rural environment. Um, and when we said sustainable, um, yeah, we kind of just looked at it as not only being green sustainable, but sustainable in a community. So we proposed, um, this was just a site diagram showing um, where we decided to position our site. It's the middle one um, where it says informal settlement. I'm in an area called Wolfalier. This is just a site diagram. Um, yeah, and basically the community that we latched onto doesn't really have a school, and there's, the closest school is about 10 k's away. Um, so it really does need, I think it did need a school as well as um, provision of other amenities which the community didn't have. Um, this was just our thinking process. Um, it was a bit crazy. Um, but it's a, it's a very simple structure. Um, just drawing on sort of the rural typology of um, the, yeah, the farm shed. Um, and within that, provide something a lot more softer. Um, we, we used something green called, um, uh, we used hay walls and a lot more like timberish kind of um, materials on the inside, <coughs> protected by this, this shed on the outside. Um, and then in front of that, parallel with, with the school, was a, an, uh, like a rural market, which would operate while school is operating. And in that way, provide um, opportunity for parents or people of the community to make dialogue with what's happening in the school, and support the community and improve sustainability of, of the school and the community. Um, so the market is just shown there on the south side of the plan. Um, and then we created this protected environment on the inside. And on the right hand side um, is a, it's sort of like a, a hall or shed which reacted to, um, I don't know if there's a side plan, probably not. Um, it reacted to the soccer pitch of the, the community. Um, so it, it really like breathed with, with the project, with the community, um, and worked with it. Okay, then. Um, Sort of our major project that year was the Stuta Street Housing Project, which is located um, in Braunfontein, quite close to Bits. Um, and it was just really a huge learning experience for everyone that did it, um, because you, we had to pack in, I think, I don't know how many students, but it was an insane amount, um, and still provide um, good lighting and, and all the other sorts of amenities that you might need. So it turned out looking a bit like I don't know, a parking garage, <laughs> but it works quite well, I promise. <laughs> um, and the idea was actually just based on um, having, having a vertical street, um, sort of having this, on the south side there's that, that spine, which is sort of a street extruded up from the ground, and that's sort of where people would gather and meet while, while circulating to their parts, their different parts of living space. Um, so that was just the concept. That's the context. Quite a really rich, nice area. Um, yeah, and then we, we moved from that into um, these are just the design drawings. Model. Okay, and then we moved into construction. So this was a structural model. It became quite rational, unfortunately. But I think just with the time constraints, we just really had to tr somehow find a way of accommodating everything they required whilst they're making it a green building. Um, yeah, the ground for plan. So these are just all our technical drawings. <coughs> um, that year I also did um, a theory paper on the Workers' Museum, which if anyone goes to Joburg, um, is worthwhile visiting. It's on a very interesting site, and I think I really grew from, from writing this paper. Um, and it was just dealing with sort of um, erasure and 
um, the flux that J Johannesburg experiences um, based on, yeah, there isn't really a strong feeling for um, keeping sites like they, like they are. There isn't a strong want for memory and that sort of thing. So it was just identifying that issue um, within Johannesburg. Um, yeah, and I created like a traces map, which is on the right hand side. Um, yeah, finally, just our last third year project was um, this Germiston project. Um, Germiston is quite a strange space that has these kind of spaces where um, they were designed for public space, but they're terribly underused, and no one uses them. Yeah, no one uses them, and they're quite dangerous. So it was just the brief was just asking to react to that. <coughs> Um, and how I did that was to introduce sort of space that a race space along a movement path, um, where um, stairs would there would be a proposed like public stairs that face onto the square, which would activate the square where our site was positioned, and then also provide for multi-use um, and other sort of sustainable um, ideas just to make the building work and the space around it work. But it became quite an urban project. Um, reacting to a lot of the problems um, in that area. Okay, I'll just get that out. <laughs> okay, so um, just basically after looking at all of these projects, um, we had to sort of come up with a design approach that um, we proposed in our portfolios that was then sent for the competition. And I think just looking at all my projects, I think what I got out from the way I approached things was just an understanding that I think architecture, although when you have like a, a sexy building or something really, really cool, I think at some point, I think you actually miss the point in a way, because you're not designing for people anymore and the dignity of the people living in the space. So I think what I'd like to do in the work that I continue with from now on is just really look at um, how spaces connect to the city um, and how they um, yeah, react in terms of providing for the people inside and not just doing something superficial, which I think architecture sometimes creates this environment that looks upon itself and only for itself. So I don't know if that could inspire anyone, but that's just how I look at things. Okay, so this was then the 24-hour project. Um, once again, reacting to spaces that are quite inert and dead. Um, I think Michael might, might have shown something similar. Um, but it's a very strange space where the site was situated because um, there was quite a lot of movement, yeah, very, very fast taxis on a one-way street. Um, and then, yeah, so it was it's very, very harsh and not really pedestrian orientated. But then pushed to the sides was this informal trade, um, which was quite interesting. So this like, duality of um, harshness and then this want for uh, pedestrian reactivity uh, emerged. Um, and also what is quite interesting in this, in this area was um, the fact that it's, it's very administrative because there's a lot of um, legislature and government buildings in the area, which, which is quite bad, I think, because they, they all sort of are fenced in and turn away from the street. So it's this very like controlled like police area, <laughs> um, which is really quite strange considering they're supposed to be public buildings. Um, so yeah, basically my approach was just trying to link back this building that we had the opportunity to design for back to the street and provide for um, more public life. Um, okay. um, yeah, so my idea just kind of stemmed from having sort of a street that if you look in the image on the left hand side at the top, um, having this public walkway that is drawn into the building, which also splits and is used as an architectural element um, to define the two different apartments which we had to provide for, as well as for uh, allowing access to light to um, the space on the left hand side. Um, and then at the same time, I also provided for sort of like a permeable, a permeable um, facade which faced onto the street, which um, below had um, yeah, retail opportunity um, and provision for um, storage for informal trade and that sort of thing. Um, and then above the bedroom windows facing onto the street so that you, you always have eyes on the street and more security and protection. Um, and then I kind of had these obtrusive arms that like jumps onto the street 
um, just to sort of provide for a bit of slowing down of all the activity that happened along the street um, and just soften and, and, and bring down the scale to the pedestrian, which I think was really necessary um, on that given site. Um, yeah, so basically that's, that's me. Um, I think Michael showed this picture, so sorry for being unoriginal. Um, but it was really a lovely experience, um, and I'm really grateful that we were able to do it. And thanks to Paul for organizing it as well as he did. Um, yeah, and I, it was really lovely representing BIT. Um, and thanks for listening to me. Cool, thank you. Take the south part of the building um, and rather cut away from it 
placed it on top, and in that space you created an urban connector, which connected to the south side of the site, um, that had a, uh, the wild, so it was a beautiful viewpoint. As well as elevating the building, then had this platform which could view onto the north side of the building. My last project I'll present to you is uh, Marlborough South. We had to deal with RDP housing, and this particular project dealt with uh, heterotopian spaces within the RDP housing, as they, they seem to be houses owned by the initial owners. However, as you got to deal with the site, you actually realized that these particular people, the houses didn't conform to their aspirations. So what they did was they further rented out the house to make a living of it so they could live closer to the city. And then the, the tenants then further sub-rented it out. So it created this whole heterotopian space, not really um, showing and revealing what is really happening. So my intervention was in that particular space. I wanted to bring back the owners of the house without um, taking both of the tenants out so that all the, the different aspects of the architecture could then relate into one space. So taking the structure of the RDP house, I removed the roof, I elevated it because they um, prefabricated trusses, I inverted them upside down to create another space above so that the, tenant, the owners would have the ground floor space as intended Above them, with the elevator space, would be the rented space, and then further above, within the trusses, would be the sub-rented space. In terms of the competition that we did for FIPS, and the concept was the medium for exchange, and um, my approach was to rather look outside of the building and the particular site, and to focus on the particular energies that happen around, and which could then inform the building. So looking at the mapping, I looked at all the major routes and particular trade opportunities and the informalities, particularly by the uh, taxi rank, where the informal recycling and informal trading would occur. And the intention was to use all these particular energies from around the site into my building, which then would convert the energy. As the brief was very, very complex and we had so many programs to consider, my complete idea in terms of my design was to break it up into three. So on the north, the north side, having both uh, resident apartments, the middle section, a place for um, exchange, and then the front for the informalities where most of the processes happen. So in total, the idea was that to have the informal traders along that route, which was particularly uh, an informal space, they would move along um, into that space, it would be recessed, it would have a drop off and a recycling center, which during the night would become a recycling center, <coughs> so one man's trash would become another man's treasure, as I'll explain now, and um, would also become a temporary shelter during the night. Then the division space, there was a bridge crossing from the residence into the building. The idea was that then after time, that bridge could, could then be used inside the, the middle section of the building, that there was a distance between the two. So when they passed away, the idea was that um, the, the front section could then become a museum, as well as a library, as well as an art center, as the, the idea was to have a library and a museum as a result of the design. So the intention was to have three programs, which ultimately transformed into two separate programs. And that was my presentation. On behalf of all of us, we'd like to thank Paul, as well as the Fuchs, for an incredible experience, and not only for getting us all together and we could teach each other, but for showing us our talents and making us believe in ourselves. Thank you very much.